Um, we took the two, we did this twice, once with a set of test tubes where we just put it, left it in, um, in the fume hood. And then the second one, we exposed it to light. So we just had got out some of the bright heat lamps. We were using them more for the light than the heat. Um, and we just set up the, the second set of test tubes was just in front of, was exposed to that light to both keep things a little bit warm, but mostly expose it to light, like we talked about earlier, to act as an initiator. So you'll have two sets of data here that I'll write up on the board. Um, and essentially the, the procedure or the lab write-up for this is going to be a case of, okay, write out what the expected product is for each of these. And there we're going to follow the um, the rules for stability, and we'll talk about why that is in a second. Um, we'll finish this morning's lecture because that's going to kind of make it make sense. How do, how do you predict which product you get? Um, turns out bromine is really selective. Chlorine is a little bit more reactive, so you get a, a big mixture based on statistics. Um, Bromine is not as reactive, so you get preferentially get just the most favorable product if you use bromine. Um, so you're going to write out the reaction for each of these, and then you're going to calculate the um, what is the average rate of the reaction. If you can figure out how many moles of bromine you started with, and you and you can figure out how many seconds it took for the entire reaction to come to react, then you can say okay my change in the molarity of bromine is this much divided by my change in time. So you're going to actually figure out, calculate the, the um, rate itself um, by hand, just by figuring out how many, mol what the molarity is of bromine was to start and end with. And since we can assume um, that, I think, we can't assume that in every case, but in this case, we wind up with the same number of moles of bromine and the same number of moles of your hydrocarbon. So you can assume that your number of moles of bromine is going to be, um, we can just use that as a stand-in for the reaction itself because it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to talk about about the lab before we talk about a little bit more about the theory. Um, it has you calculate relative rates, which is just going to meet, we're going to put, call one of them the, the baseline reaction rate, um, which we're going to use the tertiary carbon. And so the reaction rate for everything that's got resonance should be a number that's greater than one for the relative rate. So it just means take the rate of of um, each one and divide by the rate for the tertiary carbon, right? And then, so you sh for things that happen faster than the tertiary carbon, you should get a relative rate that's greater than one. For things that happen slower than the tertiary carbon, um, you should get a number less than one for that relative rate. Um, I do not mean to be screen sharing yet, but thank you for checking, um, mainly because there's not a whole lot for me to, I guess I might as well start sharing now. Um, I'm just looking at the procedure itself and um, making sure I covered all the bases. What you guys will actually turn in is just in the analysis section here. Your report is just going to be you writing down your data. Um, and so at the end, after I finish this morning's lecture, which is only a couple more slides, it'll go quick. I'll put the data on the whiteboard and have you guys write it down by hand as though you were in lab instead of just giving you an Excel sheet. I'll make it a little bit more lab-like by making you write it on a piece of paper first um, before you turn around and put it into Excel. Um, I'll write that down after we finish the, the lab. And then, so then your report sheet will be the data table and then um, answering these questions. Um, and since this is all hypothetical anyway, I had to make some substitutions last year to put uh, cyclohexanol in instead of one of the other ones we were using. Um, so this doesn't pertain to you guys because none of your compounds have OH groups. As long as I'm making up data, I might as well make it up for the perfect case, assuming that our, our stock room had everything we needed. Um, and 
think that that's, and then it has you draw one, just one mechanism. So remember that the mechanism is going to be pretty much the same for all of these, because I'm only going to have you write it out once, because I don't want to look at seven pages of mechanisms from each of you, and um, and you guys don't want to write seven pages of the same mechanism. So just remember that your mechanism would be the same for all of these. It's just a matter of finding that weakest hydrogen to remove. So let me pull up the, oh, and the, um, because of the, how weird my Zoom was being this morning, I had to pull down the, um, I had to pull down the files as four different files and then merge them on my computer and then upload them. And it's taking YouTube a while to process that. I don't know if I changed something about the resolution that's making it take longer than normal. But this morning's lecture um, should be available soon on YouTube. The link is already there. <clears throat> and just pay no attention to the fact that it mean that it uh, um, there's like 10 seconds that's just me frozen in the middle. Um, I was just more trouble than it was worth to delete that. So I just left that in there. So just skip past that. Uh, let's see. We left off here. Um, when it comes to predicting how this these reactions are going to to play out, it winds up it winds up being pretty pretty much based almost entirely on the enthalpy, right? Because there's slightly more entropy in our products because we actually have we have a mixture of different instead of just having two kinds of bonds we have four kinds of bonds now three kinds of bonds three kinds of bonds carbon hydrogen carbon halide hydrogen halide which means that it's slightly more disorganized slightly more random but for the most part when we're looking at entropy we're talking about how many gas molecules do we have and that didn't really change um, so for the most part, we can basically leap, forget about entropy for this reaction because it's not going to play a significant role. So, and that, that makes things a lot simpler too, because enthalpy was just, was the chemical bonds, right? That was a lot easier to think about conceptually when we were trying to, um, to think about what's happening with these reactions. We can basically just treat enthalpy like it's the most important piece and just ignore the entropy piece. Um, and so we, if we look at the bonds broken and formed, that's just going to give us a good idea of what the overall reaction. Sorry, my children are coming to blows in the family room. Um, it's OK. It's a fairly normal occurrence. My daughter's a spitfire. Um, so when it comes to to estimating the enthalpy, we can just look at how strong each of the individual bonds are that are being formed and broken and use that to see what's going to favor one side. What we see is that breaking a fluorine fluorine bond, fluorine bonds are very, very weak, which is one of the reasons why fluorine is so reactive, which means this reaction, methane reacting with fluorine, is downhill in energy by um negative 431 kilojoules per mole which you guys don't have that great of a of an intuition um but a normal reaction that we would consider something that we could let happen at room temperature is about negative 100 kilojoules per mole is pretty pretty downhill in energy and fluorine is four times greater than that so basically we don't use fluorine because it's just way too reactive you would have to do this at like liquid nitrogen temperatures to get it to go slow enough that you didn't blow something up. Um, which is one of the reasons why fluorine, fluorine has a lot of really interesting properties. Um, it's one of the reasons why, despite how long it's been around, Teflon is still pretty expensive for, for a pretty simple polymer. Um, it's because fluorine is really tricky to work with without blowing things up. And they really don't like it when you blow up, you know, an entire factory because you didn't plan for to keep things at a cold enough temperature when you design that that chemical plant. Um, 
chlorine and bromine are both more in a more reasonable region when it comes to how downhill in energy they are. Chlorine's pretty exothermic, but it's not that bad. Bromine is barely exothermic. And then iodine isn't exothermic at all. It's actually uphill in energy to get iodine to go through this reaction, which is um, one of the reasons why we use iodine in a lot of practical applications where we know it's going to be exposed to your skin. So I guess iodine as a swab, as, as a disinfectant is really useful because we know it won't go through these free radical reactions as easily and cause lots of problems. Um, bromine and chlorine both would. You could use, in theory, you could use bromine um, to disinfect an air, you know, a wound, but it would really, really hurt. Um, my worst chemical accident in a lab ever was not actually in a lab. It was in the stock room when I was cleaning things up when I was, uh, I was probably 19 at the time. Um, and, uh, and somebody put a bottle of liquid bromine next to the sink, which when you work in the lab, that just means clean this up if you're the, the dishwasher. Um, and I, it wasn't labeled or anything. So I just, okay, well, it's not labeled. It can't be that bad. So I just dumped it down the sink and it hit the hot water in the, in the sink and immediately all vaporized. And I got a good lung full of bromine um, and I uh, got some chemical burns in my, in my esophagus and in my lungs, um, which is not fun. It was about two months before I could like walk up a flight of stairs without stopping to take a break. Um, but, uh, and that was at sea level. Um, so bromine is still dangerous and reactive. We wouldn't want to use bromine to disinfect your average um, for your average disinfectant for that reason. What you, what you think about is bromine as being bromine tablets that you put in like a hot tub or something um, is actually a bromate that releases bromine at a very low level kind of constantly at that temperature. It, it's basically breaking down to make bromine and sodium oxide. Um, so that's what we use in this case um, for, for this lab. We're going to use bromine. Um, also, bromine has the advantage of being liquid at room temperature and chlorine doesn't. If you want to use chlorine gas, you have to get a canister of it or you have to generate it yourself, um, which are both um, a problem. We don't necessarily want to have an entire canister of chlorine gas for one experiment um, once a year. Um, and so the, the thermodynamics, it turns out, wind up impacting the kinetics a lot. Because when we look at how what that barrier is that we have to get through, um, it turns out that that's going to be very dependent on this first these propagation steps, right? Because the initiation is just the start of things, and that's going to happen pretty quickly. The rate determining step is going to be the propagation steps, um, and we can look at these and say, okay, well, whichever one of these is less downhill in energy is probably gonna be the rate determining step because if we know that, if we know the energy levels for the react for the products and the reactants for a specific step. So let's say black is for bromine. And so for this first propagation step, we know that it's uphill in energy plus 42 kilojoules per mole. Well, we don't necessarily know what the activation energy is, but we know it has to be higher than 42 kilojoules per mole, right? Because the, the transition state has to be higher in energy than either the products or the intermediates or the reactants or the intermediates. So just knowing what this intermediate energy level is allows us to kind of estimate what the kinetics, what the, the activation energy is going to look like as well. And so if you look at the, the um, energies here, just looking at the enthalpies, um, you see that chlorine is downhill in energy for both of these, but this first one is less downhill in energy. And so the halogen pulling off a hydrogen to make the, um, the carbon, uh, the carbon-based radical, there's a term for that, but I'm going to butcher it if I try and make it up on the spot. Um, it's like carb carbocation or carbanion. There's a, a word for a carbon-based free radical, but I can't remember it right now. Um, so this first step for all of them is going to be the rate determining step. Um, and we can see that depending on which 
hydrogen it pulls off, that's going to affect what the rate is of this rate determining step. And so chlorine, the fact that they're all downhill in energy for chlorine means that chlorine is going to pick, is not going to be very picky. Chlorine radicals will pull a hydrogen, any hydrogen off that it runs into. It's going to pick, be slightly more likely to pull off a, you know, a tertiary hydrogen. Um, but for the most part, you're going to get a mixture of everything if you use chlorine. If you use bromine, though, it being uphill in energy means it goes slowly enough that you're only going to get the most favorable product. All right, so here's, here's what the um, propagation steps might look like for chlorination. Everything being downhill means it's all going to react. It's just a matter of what it runs into first. Bromine making an uphill intermediate means that it's going to be more selective about which proton it pulls off. So we use bromine a lot more often in synthesis because it's more predictable. Um, and it's liquid at room temperatures, which means you can store it in your, in your uh, stock room. And you can't do that with chlorine without a, a gas cylinder. So if we, if we ignore which radical is more favor, favorable, if we just look at, let's just say so it's going to react with something. And what are the odds that a halide runs into a secondary car or hydrogen versus a primary hydrogen? We can actually, if we were talking about something like fluorine that was super, super reactive, we would just look at it and say, well, statistically speaking, 75% of the hydrogens are on a primary carbon. Therefore, we would expect to get this 75-25 ratio of the product. 75% of the time we would add a fluorine to a primary carbon and 25% of the time it would be to a secondary carbon. This would be if we're ignoring the, the stability of the intermediates. Chlorine is sort of in that gray area where sometimes, or it, where the stability of the intermediate plays a role, but it still will react with, with a little bit with everything. So we actually get like a 60-40 ratio if we do this reaction with chlorine. But if we do this with, um, with bromine, so in this case, what we're seeing is that it's a lower, because this, the secondary radical is more stable, we wind up with it also having a lower transition state barrier, which means you're more likely to make this secondary radical than you are to make the primary radical. But there are more primary hydrogens around. So you wind up with an almost an even mixture in this case. But with bromine, we can essentially say, especially if it's a tertiary, so chlorine, um, with methyl pro reacting with methyl propane, you get like a 35% of your product is the tertiary chloride and 65% of it is the primary chloride because there are so many more primary hydrogens. So there's a much like more likely chance that your chlorine happens to run into one of the primary hydrogens. It's still going to be more stable if it makes the tertiary radical, but not so much so that it slows everything else down. But because blow because bromine is uphill in energy, bromine is way more selective. It won't pull off those primary, um, those primary hydrogens because that's even more uphill in energy than pulling off a tertiary one. Right? So when we're talking about predicting products, if it's with chlorine, you're going to get a little bit of everything. And I'm not necessarily going to expect you to know exactly what these percentages are. So if you, basically, if, you, if we have this reacting with chlorine, you've got to write down all the possible products. If it's bromine, you only really have to write down the most favorable product. And then maybe if I get really specific, you could say, and trace amounts of these other possibilities. All right, so chlorine is just a lot more random because it's way more reactive. versus bromine that's only going to make that most stable form. So quick practice. What's the major product obtained upon radical bromination of 2,2,4-trimethylpentane? Is 
there's a lot of possible products we could make, but it being bromine means we're mostly going to make the most stable form. So brominating the primary carbons here would give us one product. I'm just going to go through and say where all the different places it could be brominated first, and then we'll say which one's the most favorable. Any of these three methyl groups is going to give us the same product, right? because we can't tell the difference between any of those CH3 groups. Those are all gonna be identical products. There is no hydrogen on this, on the carbon that has three methyls attached to it. There is no hydrogen there. So we're not gonna pull the, anything off there. There's a secondary carbon there. And then there's a tertiary carbon There's a tertiary carbon hydrogen right there. So the green one is going to be the most stable. And so if we're talking about bromination, we're going to predominantly make the, end, the isomer where you put the bromine on the carbon circled in green. What about the carbon um, that's just right of the purple carbon? So that carbon does not have any hydrogens on it. It already has four bonds and they're all going to other carbons. And this reaction is not strong enough to pull off an entire carbon. We can't break a carbon-carbon bond with this. So we're only looking at replacing hydrogens and that one that I X'd out in black doesn't have any hydrogens to remove. All right, so the most prominent or the, the major product would look like this. If we said chlorination, then we're not just going to be looking for the major product. We're going to get significant amounts of everything if it's the chlorinated product. So we would have four different products if we chlorinated it through radical chlorination. We're going to get the blue product that where we replace a hydrogen um, on a primary carbon with chlorine. And then we're going to get the, ye the yellowish orange product where we put a chlorine on one of these carbons. We're going to get the green product where there's a chlorine on the green carbon. And then we're going to get the purple product where there's a chlorine on the secondary carbon here. And we're just going to get some of all of those. We can we could favor one you know, getting one in particular, if we did it at a certain, if we did it at low temperatures, we could favor getting just the most favorable one, which would be the green one again. Um, because if you do it at low temperatures, that makes it harder to get over those transition state barriers. If it's harder to get over those transition, transition state barriers, that means that you're going to favor the product that has the lowest transition state barrier. But at room temperature, we're just going to get a mess of stuff. And then we'd have to worry about separating out one of them in particular if we wanted one of those isomers. Um, so for again, we're going to keep coming back to the fact bromine is really commonly used because it's nice middle of the road. It reacts quickly, more quickly than iodine, but not as quickly as chlorine or fluorine. Um, it's a good leaving group. It's a better leaving group than chlorine. And it's easier to work with than iodine. So for a lot of synthesis stuff, we see bromine used for that reason as well. All right, so what you guys are going to do for this lab is you guys are going to basically do that same thing for each of these six hydrocarbons. Oh, and this is the wrong version. Let me fix this. I got rid of those alcohols. Um, you have methyl, methyl cyclohexane and t-butyl um, benzene that 
I thought I saved, but I must not have uploaded that one. So let me fix that link here. Um, because they're all supposed to be hydrocarbons, no oxygen involved. Um, right, Sean, so then, about, sorry, yeah. quick about that example you just had up there. So is it we're only attaching one bromine under that? We're not attaching the two? Correct. And that's that's because the other bromine, if you think about what the mechanism was, the first step of the mechanism is you make two bromine radicals, right? The second step is one of those bromine radicals has to pull a hydrogen off to make room for the other bromine to come in. So your side product is going to be HBr. Good question. Um, and again, let me get the right file uploaded here. Um, and then as soon as I get the right file uploaded, I'll put all the data on the board for you guys. And then afterwards, I'll get the video link up as well. Um, Oh, I'm in the wrong, ah, that explains it. I'm in last year's course, that's why. Um, so maybe you guys already have the right one. Yeah, you guys already have the right one up there. All right, so your the data is going to look like something like the raw data is going to look like this. And I'm screen share. Um, so in each of these cases, you're adding the same amount of bromine to each of these. And you are going to have to do some, some molarity calculations to figure out how much bromine got added initially. What is your initial concentration of bromine when you mix everything together? Um, but for your first reaction, which was toluene, when you did the reaction with no light, with no excess light, it's not like we turned off all the lights in the lab. Um, although you do that in some labs, sometimes you do have to do things in a dark room in chemistry. Um, if you're dealing with stuff that's really sensitive to light. Uh, I spent two summers in a tiny little closet like lab. That was that's the it was about the same size as my office at LTCC for those of you guys who know that office, um, with foil taped over the windows. Um, got really, it got a little punchy in there. It was a little bit like you know about month three of quarantine when everybody started acting really weird, like, and now we've settled back into it a little bit. But um, after after forty hours and a week of being in the dark, literally. Uh, we were studying, we were looking at a, um, a compound that when you shined UV light on it, it emitted, it, it fluoresced and phosphoresced at specific wavelengths. But if you had the overhead lights on, you couldn't see the light um, that was looking at, it was uh, naphthalene actually. Naphthalene, when you allow, when you shine light on naphthalene, it, that's the right wavelength, it glows in two different wavelengths, it fluoresces and phosphoresces. And depending on what the temperature is and how you deposit it on the surface, it will change what wavelength it glows at. Um, and so we were studying that, and it was just such a faint amount that if we had the overhead lights on, that's all we could see was the overhead lights on our sensors. That's pretty cool. So wait, you literally were in the dark then? You're like, how, that's what I'm saying. Like, how you couldn't see at all, or you just used the glowing? We used use the monitors basically. Um, there was a small amount of light that came in, but if uh, if the advisors noticed that show up in all, any of our data, we got yelled at um, for not being careful enough. So like we could have the door open to have a little bit of light, but then when we were actually taking data, we had to uh, we had to make sure everything was really really dark. Um, and it's not listed on here, but t-butyl benzene. Um, when they did this reaction, they got a no reaction when it was done without light. It was so slow that over the course of the lab, they did not see the reaction complete. Um, so we would we'd expect it to be, you know, if you look at each of these, there's about a two and a half, a factor of two and a half difference with the light. 
we would expect it to be something like that here, but two and a half times longer than half an hour would be an hour and 15 minutes. And by the time got to, they, they just did not wind up seeing it happen at all. And it doesn't always follow that linear scaling because it is an exponential relationship there. So um, for that one, you don't have to find the relative rate. You can just say it didn't happen. And so is everybody more or less clear on what the objective is? Figure out what your overall rate was for the reaction by looking at how much your concentration of bromine changed. So you need your initial concentration of bromine, and you can assume for all of these that finished, the final concentration of bromine was zero. And then your change in time is what's given here. That, so that's how you're going to calculate the rates. And so your actual rate equation, and I put this on. Does everybody have the numbers written down for starters? I'll put them back no. up there if anybody still needs okay, them. Okay, yeah. I say I need them. I just need a quick second, but yeah. So I just want to write this equation up here real quick, and then I'll go back to them. For all of these, you can say that your rate is equal to your change in concentration of bromine over your change in time. Technically negative because the bromine's a reactant and our rates should always be positive. So if you know what your starting concentration of bromine is and you know your final concentration is zero, then we're just going to divide your starting concentration of bromine by the time. And you'll get a and you'll get a rate for the reaction, right? So and you really since you're starting with the same amount of bromine for all of these, you're only got to do that calculation once to get your initial concentration of bromine, right? And then once you have that initial concentration of bromine, you just can divide by the time for the reaction for each of them. Um, it's one of the reasons why when we design these experiments. Um, <clears throat> why we do things like, um, you know, adds this much of a solution and then you make up for it by adding solvent that has nothing in it. So you have the same starting volume for all of them, because that means that you're going to have the same starting concentration of bromine for all of them, even if you started with a different amount of the various reactants. All right, so it's, uh, they're very typically very carefully designed that way. All right. Anybody have any questions before I turn you loose on it? All right, I'll give, I'll leave this up a few more minutes. Let's see, okay. Um, and I will still be here. Feel free to log off to work on this since I know the internet's weird. We had another storm coming in, maybe a little bit of a storm anyway. Um, and then um, I'll also put open some breakout rooms for anybody who wants to, um, to stick around and do that. I'll be here until everybody's gone or until four, whichever comes first. Um, I'll stay here for when everybody logs off. I usually stay on, on the Zoom for about another 15, 30 minutes afterwards. Um, to make sure nobody else comes back in to ask a question. But if everybody's been gone for a while, then I'll probably log off as well. And you can catch me in office hours or uh, by email if you have any other questions. All right. Everybody good with the data? Cool. I will stop sharing then and uh, have fun. Sean. I'm a bit slow. Can you explain um, how to put it in the formula, please? Again. <laughs> no worries. You're not. You're not slow. It's. I was, remember back when we first did. You also. It's been longer since you had Gen Chem than anybody else. So I, I went faster on that section. Um, so rate is always a change in concentration over a change in time. Remember, change is just final but minus initial. So if, and if you so if you know that your if you know that your final concentration 
is zero because we're saying all of it's getting used up. And then we can say, we can calculate our initial concentration of bromine by just figuring out how many moles of bromine we have divided by the number of liters, right? So then when we plug it in to get the rate, we're going to get um, your rate is going to be concentration of bromine final minus concentration of bromine initial over your change in time, which is T final minus T initial. We can just assume that T initial is zero for all of them, right? And so just plug in your time here. This is zero for all of them. And then all of this in, in negative, because we are talking about a reactant being used up and our rate needs to be positive. So if this number is going to be zero and this number is going to be zero. So we just need your initial concentration of bromine divided by the time. And just watch, make sure that your time is the same units, because some of them were recorded in minutes and some were in seconds. So just make sure you're consistent there. You can either do it in minutes or seconds, as long as they're all the same. OK, thank you. No problem. Sorry, Sean. Um, the concentration initial, um, <clears throat> that's the concentration over length. What is that? Is that an Sorry, L? Liters. Sorry, liters. Oh, liters. OK. So technically volume, but in molarity, we're very specific about our volume and it has to be in liters. Oh, okay. Okay. So it's, it's moles over liters. Is right. that what the and, end? Okay. And that's, that's right when you first dump everything together. So if you figure out how many moles of bromine you're adding from the starting solution, and mm -hmm. then we mix everything together and you went from, you know, to a final volume, final reaction volume of four milliliters or something like that. Mm -hmm. you would want that that total volume of all of your stuff that you mix together would go in here as okay leaders. that's okay okay awesome thank you no problem casey do you have your hand up uh, i don't think so oh that's sorry that's my cursor you know when you hover your mouse right over on uh, on zoom you can drag the different windows around and it was right where you're your little icon shows up when you raise your hand. Well, I'm sure I'll have a question in a minute. Sean, I got two questions. Uh, they're kind of what you were talking, they pertain to what you were talking about earlier in lecture today. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, if, and do is that compound thing where they use the UV light? Is that like when you, what they do at the dentist when you get, if there's yes. like a new type and then they stick that light in your mouth? Yeah, they didn't used to do that, right? The way they used to do fillings was literally they would melt um, an amalgam, which was had mercury and silver mixed together, and they would like pour that into tiny holes and let it harden. Um, now what they do is they they use one of those. That's exactly what it's doing. It's curing, um, and then they can and it happens really quickly. Um, actually, one of the guys who invented that process um, was in uh, my department when I was in grad school. He was one of the professors. He worked mostly with the dental school, but he designed new dental polymers. Um, and uh, yeah, but that's exactly what it is. They call that a photo initiator. And then the other one, it, I, uh, I had heard that a ski company had made a new ski and their base is made like it's the core is made out of an algae based compound that's supposed to be stronger than like a I don't like a, a wood core or anything that they have in there before it what like how is that what how do they do that that's a little bit tricky because it because they might be using gmo algae um which means that they could because that's exactly what we do for like insulin right we we engineer genetically engineer yeast or e coli to produce insulin even though that organism has no need for that hormone um, just so we could then harvest it. So they might be used doing something like that where they've got the yeast 
engineered to produce a certain compound. Um, so it's really difficult for me to say off the top of my head, it could be something like a, an unsaturated fat that only that yeast or that yeast produces really cheaply that then they can polymerize with it, but it's probably something more like a genetic modification. Gotcha, cool, thanks. No worries. Sean, I got a couple questions. Yeah, let's hear them. Um, do you want time in seconds? So it can or, be either either seconds or minutes, but you want to be consistent. I wrote it down the way one of the groups from last year wrote it down, um, just because that's naturally the way people tend to write things down. Is if it's a long enough time scale, you write it down in minutes. Um, so you can either take all the ones that are in seconds and convert to minutes, or you can take all the ones that are in minutes and convert to seconds. Okay. And then I, I'm a little confused actually still with the molarity because wouldn't I, I was thinking that you wouldn't you start out because it's just um, 0.5 milliliters and it starts out at one mole. Isn't that then the molarity, like how many moles you're actually starting out with of bromine? Or am I like, I get the but point there, you'd want to reset it afterwards because that's the new liquid medium, but isn't it actual the molecules that we're worried about? So we're starting with one one molar bromine like you said but then we're we're diluting it right and so it, by when we mix it with the rest of the reactants so you you basically you can just you can use the dilution equation if this one looks familiar to you um where you if you added half a milliliter of one molar bromine and then you diluted it to a new volume and I think, let's see, it says half a milliliter of the bromine and your final volume for each of them is, is, is it three and a half milliliters total? Yeah, I think it's three and a half. So if you've got, if it's 1.0 molar when it's undiluted and you're adding half a milliliter of it, your new concentration is M2, and our final volume is 3.5 milliliters. Um, and it, it, it's the exact same logic as if you start with one mole per liter and you have 0.5 milliliters, you can figure out how many moles that is, and then divide that number of moles by 0 0.0035 liters. I know it should be the same number. Or it should ratio be because relative. you're going to wind up, yeah, exactly. When you convert this milliliters to liters and this milliliters to liters, they're going to wind up canceling each other out. Okay. Wait, sorry, that's milliliters. You you wrote at the end. I can't see three point five milliliters. milliliters. Yeah, and you can do as long as you're if you're using this equation for a dilution. Yeah. If you do this yeah. in your volume or in liters, then the molarity times liters will give you moles, right? Right. So just convert it to converters. Yeah. Okay. And then Sean, also on the, the lab, I'm not sure if we're supposed to do that, but it says, or I don't know where I re read this, but it says to prove that bromine is the limiting reagent or the uh, re uh, reactant. Is that still true? Or because I think I heard you say it's one to one. Um, sorry, the, the ratio that they're using it that is being used up is one to one, but the bromine is the limiting reactant. Um, and you can, but you can prove that just by looking at, um, if you look at, if you have half a milliliter of, of, the, of one of the hydrocarbons, you can just pick one of the hydrocarbons at random and compare that to how many moles of that hydrocarbon it would be versus with bromine. If you look at the different densities, you can figure out how many grams you have and it's molecular weight to figure out how many moles of each you have. And in, in all the cases, I believe you should wind up with, um, if you figure out how many moles of bromine you have, and then you should be well under your moles of hydrocarbon. 
So basically just do a spot check, pick one of them, look up a density for it, figure out how many moles of hydrocarbon you added and compare that to the number of moles of bromine that you added. And it should be, the bromine should run out much quicker or should be a much smaller number. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense, except I don't know, they don't give you molarity of the um, hydrocarbons, I don't think. You can assume that they're, if it, if it just says add half a milliliter of the hydrocarbon, you can assume that it's, that it's pure, which means you can just look at the density. Oh. And all, most hydrocarbons have a density of around 0.8 grams per milliliter. Um, although I would, to, in the, for the sake of showing this, you'd want to actually look up a density. If I was just doing this in, in my head or back of the envelope calculation, I would just, for any of these, I would just assume a density of 0.8 or so. Um, but uh, you guys, you would actually want to look up the density of toluene, say toluene would be a good one because there's lots of data. It's easy to find the data on toluene okay. and figure out how yeah. many moles of that you started with compared to moles of bromine. Okay, yeah, thanks. Sean, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm just, I'm looking at the lab and I'm assuming you want us to just go through the analysis and answer those questions. Is that what we're doing? Yes. Okay. So I still, I want you to fill out the report sheet. So I gave you raw data, but I still want you the data table. Mm -hmm. um, had you fill in more, had you do some analysis as well? Like what is the weakest, the, the, the easiest hydrogen to abstract? What is the structure? So go through and do your data table um, and the way that the procedure has you fill out the data table. Okay. And then, okay. but so you're turning in that data table filled out and then also the analysis questions. Okay, all right, okay, thank you. No problem. Um, the different ways of discussing, discussing the types of hydrogens we have. I was just going to go through these vocab terms since we've never done them in a systematic way. We've just kind of been adding them haphazardly. So let me get zoomed in on the whiteboard here and we'll see if this answers your question. And if not, then yeah, we can hop into a um, breakout room and talk about what you have written there. Um, so aliphatic is a really generic term that just me basically means that there's no resonance. Um, and so anything that is more, that has an sp3 carbon between it and the benzene ring is going to be aliphatic. Um, these next two that I'm going to talk about are kind of the same. Any hydrogens, we, we talked about the term vanillic earlier. Um, aromatic hydrogens and vanillic hydrogens are the ones directly attached to the pi systems. And so those are going to be a lot harder to pull off than anything else. So we don't actually have any vanillic systems in this one, but just for the sake of going through the different possibilities, um, I just made up this molecule that has a little bit of everything on it. So the aliphatic means no resonance. Aromatic and vanillic also have no resonance because they're directly attached to the pi system already. They can't resonate anymore. If you pulled one of these off, if we turn one of these aromatic hydrogens into a radical, it couldn't really resonate because this carbon already has a pi bond that's part of the resonance structure. So the vanillic and the aromatic hydrogens, they are their own category, but they're not really going to matter as far as this one because they're even less likely to react than a methyl um, hydrogen. And then the last category here, if it can resonate, but it's not resonating with a benzene ring, if it's resonating with just a double bond, we would call that, that's our allylic. I'm not sure if there's four L's in allylic or just three. Pretty sure there's at least three. That looks like too many L's. I think it's like that. Um, allylic means that it that if you pull the hydrogen off, it could resonate because it's adjacent to an alkene. 
And then benzylic is the exact same thing, except instead of just being adjacent to an alkene, it's adjacent to an entire benzene ring. Right, so beyond primary, tertiary, primary, secondary, tertiary, these are the other qualitative words. They're not really qualitative. Um, are other descriptive words for classes of hydrogens. So for describing all the different types of hydrogens, they're all going to have, and you don't need to specify secondary aromatic because every aromatic hydrogen is secondary. Um, but for most of the rest of these, you would say it's you know, primary aliphatic or it's secondary benzylic or it's primary allylic. So pick primary, secondary, tertiary, and then pick one of these terms for each of the hydrogens. And that's that will give you enough description of those that you should be able to arrange the reactivity based on that. Does that clear up your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. And then is that helpful for you too, Elke? So Sean, for part two of the analysis, are you just looking, sorry, um, is it just that the rate reaction with the final versus initial? Oh wait, no, 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 sorry, that's number three. Um, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> what, uh, what reaction or what? Um, formula is that for two? Was that? I can't hear you. Sorry. No, sorry. I forgot to unmute. Um, for lowercase d, we're using that. It's the same as, a, as in calculus, except that us not being in calculus means that we're just going to treat it like it's a delta change in. So final minus initial. Oh, so, oh, oh, that is just delta. Okay. It's they it they get write it as as calculus terms, but really it's more like like the physics definition of delta rather than actually doing a derivation. Does that make oh, sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so it's just um, the change in bromine over the change in time, but I don't. Um, so that has nothing to do with the raw data that you gave us, right? The, cha the change in time does. The change in bromine is going to be the same for everything that reacted because you started with the same amount of bromine everywhere, right? Uh-huh, right. But the change in time is going to be different for each of them. Oh, okay. So, um... <sighs> okay, so then the change in bromine is, um, sorry, the, the initial is zero, or no, the final is zero. What did we write? You're, you're correct. The final is zero because that's, we're using, we're using that as our endpoint. When we can't see the bromine anymore, we can say that the reaction's done. Okay. And then the initial was 0.5 milliliters. Use, use this equation, remember? Oh, right. OK, so 0.143 moles. Something like that. OK. I would have thought 0.166 repeating. Oh, yeah, I don't know. I did it on my phone because I, I didn't know that I need my calculators today. Um, no, 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 you're so right. I was thinking um, that's I did one sixth in my head and it should have been one seventh. 
one seven oh, okay. this point one four. So that makes okay. sense. So, yeah, that's what I got too. Okay. Um, All those weird fractions turning into decimals are trickier than. It's just Delplin. negative zero point one four three moles over the difference in time for each reactant. Exactly. And the difference in time would be dark versus light. No, or, so that it would just be your your time elapsed minus zero. Your initial time is zero for each of your trials. Okay. Um and we're doing that for dark and light for each reactant. Yes. So you'll have a total of of you'll have one rate that you can't calculate because it didn't react, but then you'll everything else will be on there. So you'll have a total of 11, 11. rates. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. No problem. Hey, Sean, one more question for you. Yeah, what can I do for you? Would we assume with the isopropyl, um, with the light reaction that was instantaneous? Uh, yes, so I mean, that, that kind of gives you, you get an undefined rate in that case, right? Because you're, you're dividing by zero. Um, so if you want, you could call it one second, just for the sake of making making your math work properly because really it wasn't really instantaneous they just weren't paying attention when they took the data so call it one second sounds good thank you oh also sorry um how many decimal points do you want us on the reaction rate so number of sig figs so your change in concentration you had two sig figs on your starting concentration um, so your final rate's only going to have two sig figs, regardless of how many sig figs are on your time, right? Everything is at least, other than that that first one, that where they had an instantaneous re reaction, everything's got at least two sig figs on the time. So give me two sig figs on the rate as well. Can do. Thanks. So Sean, sorry for two, for what we were just talking about it, you, do you want it in moles per second? It's technically be moles per liter per second. So it'd be molarity over seconds. Oh, okay. Yeah, capital M, sorry. Getting them all mixed up. Okay, no worries, thanks. it's it's a throwback. Yeah. Hey, Sean, I have a question. I'm, I'm not sure if it's a repeat. Um, are we labeling every single possible um, 
high hydro, hydrogen carbon bond. So if, they, if there, there's um, like a primary and yeah. a secondary, we're gonna label them all, right? Yeah, the, I mean, the, the main, what I'm mostly looking for is the most reactive one, but since this is a lab that's about showing which ones are the most reactive, in theory, I would want you to say all the ones that are there. Um, you don't have to worry about the aromatic ones. You can just leave those off because those are so non-reactive, just like the methyl hydrogens. Um, but in theory, yeah, you should label, okay, I have this one, you know, for isopropyl benzene, you've got primary aliphatic hydrogens and tertiary benzylic hydrogens. You should write both of those because that's going to make it clear which, what is making it so that that one reacts fastest. Gotcha. Thanks. And yeah, you kind of answered my second question is, is it redundant to call aromatic secondary? Yeah, because they, they have to be secondary if they're aromatic, right? Because they're can't, and same yeah. with vanillic, really, we don't even really bother specifying secondary vanillic or primary vanillic. Technically, you could specify, um, but we just don't generally speaking worry about it. Oh, that kind of confused me. Wouldn't isn't there a difference though between primary and secondary though? Well, with, with vanillic, with the vanillic ones, the we would refer to it as the terminary or the sorry, the terminal um, vanillic yeah, okay. hydrogens, because if it's primary vanillic, it has to be at the end of the carbon chain. So we call it terminal vanillic. Um it wouldn't be wrong to call it primary vanillic, but in general, the vanillic hydrogens are in so much in their own class of reaction that just saying that they're vanillic um, is enough to kind of categorize them. And then if you wanted to get more specific, you could say primary or secondary, but it's it's a little unnecessary because, it, because they're in their own class so much. Gotcha.